Ruiz. Welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm. This is the interview show that gets deep in the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. I am your host, Scott Dr. GX Wolfi. If you enjoy this programming, subscribe to the Funkin' Stuff channel on YouTube, which is where Truth and Rhythm lives, and be an advocate by spreading the word among fellow funk, jazz, and R&B music lovers. Join Truth and Rhythm's membership program through Patreon. You can also submit a direct donation to the cause anytime at funkandstuff.net. At that site, you can also purchase the book, Everything's on the One, The First Guide of Funk. Shop for official Truth and Rhythm and Funk and Stuff merchandise and use the Amazon links for all of your online purchases, which allocates a percentage to this show. For those of you who go the extra step in supporting the show, you have my heartfelt gratitude for allowing us to continue to shine the light on those special artists whose quest is to find truth in rhythm. I am thrilled to welcome to the Truth and Rhythm Mothership trumpet and trombone player Marvin Merv Pierce, who helped hold down the powerful horn section for one of the baddest funk and soul bands of all time, the Magnificent Ohio Players. Beginning with the group's post-Westbound Rebirth and Rise to Superstardom on Mercury Records, it began with 1974's sizzling hot skin tight album, he stayed on through the early 1980s. That period included classic tracks like Jive Turkey, Heaven Must Be Like This, Fire, I Want to Be Free, Fop, Love Roller Coaster, Sweet Sticky Thing, Hoochie Coo, Far East Mississippi, and Body Vibes. Pierce then left music uh, behind to become a successful businessman specializing in technology for the golfing industry. In 2010, he co-founded Melbourne, Australia-based GPS Golf Solutions. Merv, how are you, man? I'm doing good, man. How about you? And I'd um, like to say hello to your audience out there. Oh, man, so glad we could finally make this connection happen. I know you're low to the weather, so I, I appreciate it even more. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Now, how long have you been uh, down under, so to speak? Uh, let's see. I came down under... Uh... I think in about 1990, 91, right around that period of time. Um, I stopped playing uh, after I left the band because I had a, uh, a teeth problem. And so the sound that uh, I originally could get on my horns, uh, I could no longer get because of the uh, air leakage around the, uh, the teeth. You get uh, an accident where you have damage to your mouth. It's like cutting your arm off and then they sew it back on. It just doesn't work the same. Mm. Okay. I uh, wasn't aware of that. So uh, did you take that in stride or were you pretty broken up about that? Oh, I was broken up. I was devastated about that. Yeah. I had my son even telling me, you don't sound like you sound uh, on the records. Because there'll be air escaping out. And he plays piano. I see the keyboard you have in the back. He's got one set up and he plays all of that stuff and does art and everything like that. I see. Okay. Well, I want to get back to, uh, you know, what you're doing today toward the end. But uh, for now, let's jump way back, uh, Merv. And uh, if you could tell me, you know, what got you into music in the first place and why horns? I started music... Uh, probably like everyone else did. Uh, you've got parents and grandparents and they're pushing you towards that. And then you're in the church and we all know about uh, black churches. You know, we had a fantastic uh, at the church where we were members. We had a fantastic uh, uh, group 
And uh, my grandmother would say when I was very young, you get on up there, you can play. And I'd be, <laughs> you know, couldn't play anything. But, you know, they just push you to get on stage. Junie was a member of the same church that I was, um, that I went to. Junie and I went to the same church. Uh, Dime, he occasionally attended that church as well. So uh, we were all, all pretty close. And then uh, Dime and I were members in a group called uh, Majestic Overnight Low. Uh, so we're going way, way back. Then I went off to college. And while in college, uh, I got a call from Junie one day, and he asked me just to come to an audition. And I go to the audition, and uh, <laughs> it's Ohio players before they make it. They had been on uh, a couple Rubber Town Sounds, a couple of records, and they had out uh, Pain had got just been released. And uh, I did the audition, and uh, he said, well, what instruments do you play? I said, uh, trumpet, flugelhorn, French horn, because French horn was, uh, they're all the same fingering, you know. So I, was, I played that. Trombone, valve trombone, I would just pick up because they wanted the darker sound for a couple of, uh, on a couple of records. So that, that was just something I picked up uh, along the way. Uh, fingering the same, but obviously you're many, many uh, octaves lower with the instrument than a trumpet. So uh, I got a call a little bit later and they said, well, you've, Pass the uh, the test, and uh, we'd like you to play. Well, it was the break at school because I was over at Earlham College playing football and uh, going to school there, and it was the break. So I went out on the road with the band and uh, in a trial period with the band, and I loved it. And was was uh, Pee Wee and Satch were they already there? Pee Wee and Satch were there. Yeah. We had at that time. When I joined, let's see, it was Pee Wee, Satch, Greg Webster playing drums, Junie on piano, Marshall Rock Jones on bass, and uh, Sugarfoot on guitar. Uh, our singer at the time was uh, Dale Allen. Sugar didn't like to sing. So uh, Dale was the lead singer. And uh, Sugar didn't really start breaking out until after Dale left as a full-time singer. Did, and then we started developing everything around Sugar. Merv, did, did you have any musical heroes besides, uh, I assume you looked up to the Ohio players, but who else influenced you? I loved Freddie Hubbard as a horn player, obviously. Uh, my dad didn't play an instrument, but he loved music. And my dad had a record collection second to none. Um, so I, we were always listening to some sort of music in the house. You know, uh, we'd listen to West Montgomery. We, we, we'd listen to Miles Davis. Well, we'd listen to Ella. You know, we, we, we would listen to everything. And then the genre kind of changed, you know. Uh, Little Richard came in. And ro uh, the birth of rock and roll and all of that started happening. So uh, I was pretty hip to all of that stuff. Uh, and then with the band that we had, uh, of which Diamond was part of, and uh, uh, it was called the Majestics, we were probably second most popular black band, second or third. It would have been the players number one back then, would have been Imperials. And then it would have been us, the Majestics. We we were probably the three best bands in in town. What would you say was so um, special about the players back then, early on, even you know before you joined? The players, everyone kind of looked up to the players. They were extremely tight, and they were. Very, very creative because at, uh, at that time they had Sugar and Robert Ward. I mean, two of the best guitar players ever in, in, in black music. And uh, it was just 
It was just their fluidity, <laughs> their ability to improvise, their ability to put on the show and just entertain you from 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 the get go. I would sit there and watch a band like them just standing there with my mouth open. Uh, you know, I mean, they were that they were that good. They were that tight. You know, so so when I did my audition and I'm standing there against Pee Wee and Pee Wee's doing all of this stuff, I was I was amazed. I was amazed just how good they were. So uh, because I was very well technically trained on top of it, could read, write music, play all of the, because I had played with a lot of bands uh, that that were in Dayton. I, I played in polka bands. I played in the James May Orchestra because one of my teachers was Basil Drew. Uh, then I had Frank Lefevre, who was a classical trumpet player, played with the Dayton uh, Philharmonic. Uh, so it was a, it was a different it was a different outlook on things and a different style working with those guys. How, how I mean, it, it was all inspiring. How thrilled were they? To, uh, were you when they told you you had the gig? Well, when they told me I had the gig and I told my mother I was going on the road and she said, you were going to school to be a doctor, son. <laughs> that did not go down well. So uh, I kind of just went on the road on the gig anyway, and um, it would be many years where I would go back piecemeal to go back to school and stuff. Mm. Do you remember uh, your first time on stage with those guys? Uh, I do. My first time on stage with them, the first live show that I did with them would have probably been the Armory down in Middletown, Ohio. And it was packed. And uh, I can remember when we walked out on show and we had rehearsed and rehearsed all of the moves and and everything. And uh, we didn't play the whole set the first time I went on stage. We played probably about uh, four or five songs in the set. And then they did parts of the set because we weren't totally up to speed yet at that time. When I came in, there was also, they brought in another uh, trumpet player because we were going to go with four uh, Pee Wee, Satch. They wanted four pieces, four horns. And, uh, but Bruce Napier would not make the cut. Uh, he was not a solid horn player. You know, Junie was like really super talented pianist and Junie would hit stuff and then say, then you had to respond to that. Bruce could, he wasn't quite up to speed on his acts. So, when, so when, he didn't make the cut. When you joined Merv, uh, they were still signed to Westbound. And then how long after you were no, there? No, we, we didn't even have a Westbound deal. When I joined, we didn't have a Westbound deal. That was prior to Westbound. Oh, really? They had a, we were with, uh, we were with Rubber Town Sounds. That was our record label. Uh, it was pain, pain, pain. Uh, that was the song that came out on, on Rubber Town Sounds. That came out on Rubber Town Sounds. That would be the stepping stone to get to Armin Baladian's company, Westbound. Okay, so you're on the Westbound recordings? Yes. Okay, well, I'm on I all miss, the Westbound I, 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 recordings. Oh, that's great. I misspoke in the intro there. I'm sorry about that. So you were there from, you know, uh, Pleasure and Funky Worm and... Every one of them. All right. I'm well, playing on every one go, of man. those songs. Yeah, yeah man. So uh, Westbound... Uh, I forget Armin's sidekick. But he is a great big fat guy, maybe 300 pounds. I can't even remember his name now. It's been so long, I'd have to look it back up. But uh, he came and saw us, went to Westbound. We met with him, and uh, that was our first deal. And then we came out with the, the Pain album, the Pleasure album. We came out with a whole bunch of albums. But Armin thought that didn't understand the ethos of the band. 
the band was always um they had the same uh, creed motto as the three musketeers, one for all, all for one. And he thought that Junie made everything. He didn't realize Junie was an integral part. And Junie was a great songwriter, great vocalist, had that uh, great falsetto voice. But by then, we had developed our own rhythm. The, the rhythm section had come into its own especially after Diamonds joined the group. Uh, once Diamonds joined the group, the rhythm section really started to evolve. I think Greg played drums on the first couple of albums, and then I would bring Diamonds in. I would go and see Diamonds and say, hey, because we were always having problems with Greg dropping the beat. We'd be on stage, you'd be on stage, and then you'd say, oh, Greg, what the F, man? <laughs> you know, <laughs> You just missed that part. They would call you out for that. You know, you you miss your part. They call you out. And when some, you know what how important a drummer is. The drummer drops the beat. It's like everybody stops for a second to look around. Where are we in the right now? And you're waiting on somebody to hit something to come back in. You know, so Sugar would usually come back in to bring it all back together. But uh, it got to the point where they just got fed up with Greg's drumming style, you know, because he was all, he was constantly dropping the beat. You know, and then Dime came along and Dime turns out to be one of the best rock and roll, I mean, funk drummers of all time, you know. But Dime and I had played together and I went back and I, I said to the band, I know a drummer. <laughs> and it was Diamond. Wow. Yeah, I know he came on for Ecstasy, I think, the last Westbound record. Um, yep. Yeah. And uh, so you guys had the what would be the lineup moving forward solidified, basically. What, what do you remember about the transition then from Westbound to Mercury? Because you know, not only did Diamond come on for the end of Westbound, but I mean, the sound of the band just... Um, matured in advance so much from the westbound to the mercury beginning it got tighter <clears throat> what happened was armin uh fractured the band okay armin thinking that juni was the key to everything that we did started concentrating on juni and his solo career and we would embark on the <laughs> great I'll use a Donald Trump, you know, miscarriage of, of uh, justice where we had a contract with the man and uh, Westbound Records and they wouldn't record us. They would not record us. So we traveled around the country just really, really getting tight, tight, tight. Uh, and uh, applying our trade uh, and trying to get a record deal. We wouldn't get a record deal till uh, a couple of years later after we left Westbound. It would take a couple of years, almost a couple of years before we got the, the deal with Phonogram, Mercury Records at the time. Hmm. What was it like when you went in to, to create Skin Tight? I mean, some of that was just, I understand, sort of improvised material that was turned into songs. Is that right? Improvised would be an understatement. When we were in uh, in there and they were considering hiring us, it was uh, LZ White, myself, uh, Satch's dad, and Clarence Satchel. We were all sitting there in uh, Mr. Steinberg's office, who was the president of Mercury Records Phonogram at the time. And he said, do you guys have material ready? Well, Satch was talking, and I said something. I said, yeah, it's all up here. <laughs> it's in our head. And he said, um, well, can you play a little bit? I'm a little bit. I said, are you a musician? He said, no. I said, what good would that do? I said, but if you sign us, because he had on the wall, big picture of Elton John, life size. Big picture of Bachman Turner Overdrive, life side. Big picture of Rod Stewart on the wall. I said, 
you'll have my picture up there on the wall if you give us a chance. And uh, he would give us a chance with with uh, uh, with the signing of us. And uh, I think we had a couple album deal to prove to prove ourselves because back then uh, you got about two hundred and about a quarter of a million dollars to make an album, you know, uh, start to finish. And that was a lot of money back then. Not a lot of money to make an album these days, but back then that was a lot of money. And we got the shot. But we had been practicing our craft, playing in, <laughs> like down in Louisiana on bars where they throw crap at you. You know, you're on stage and you don't play chicken song wire anymore. up in there. Yeah, you got the chicken <laughs> wire. We were doing stuff like that. You know, we, we would play anywhere, everywhere that we could get a gig. So we had we had made all of these grooves, all of those tracks. And that's when we came out. Sly had gotten big and we're looking at Sly and what he's doing. And we're saying, oh, man, we got stuff better than that. You know, we got stuff just as good. You know, uh, I can remember his first song coming out and we're thinking, oh, yeah, we got stuff like that. So uh, that's how it evolved. We went in there and we just started jamming. And we we would come up, we would sit in the studio night and day, continuously. Everybody, especially on the first first sequence of albums, everybody was there the whole time in the first sequence. But the sound was so fully realized with Skin Tight. I mean, with the high vocals in, in the background and, and Sugar's lead vocals and the, and just the whole thing was just, you know, that forged the classic Ohio player sound that moved forward right there. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Sugar developed, really started to come into his own after Junie left. After Junie left, Sugar became a force to be reckoned with because it was – we were working to the Sugar style, his vocal style then. And Sugar had a very unique style, you know, with the well, 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 everybody's copy, copied it and all of that stuff. But Sugar had that very, very unique style. And that that force developed after Junie left the band. But you, if, unless I'm mistaken, I seem to recall that you and Diamond and Billy usually did those high background vocals, right? I mean, you were part of that often too, right? Yes, but that was that was the high vocals was Diamond. I mean, was uh, Billy the really high vocals? Billy took that over after Junie after Junie left the band. Satch would find Billy and uh, up around Akron, Ohio, somewhere and found Billy. You know, I, I I don't know. It was just one day. Satch said, "I got a piano player for us." And he comes in, and it's Billy Beck. And you didn't know him before that? No. Mm -hmm. Didn't even know who Billy was. Satch knew. Mm -hmm. You know, so everybody always had some kind of inputs. Everybody was doing something, you know, to help the band. The band was, at that time, it was the Three Musketeers. One for all, all for one. That's why... In the very early stages, everything we always put written by Ohio players because on every every songs everybody contributed something. So you'd say, "Well, Pee Wee came up with that horn part." Okay, yeah. Well, how do you write that down? Who did what? You know, everybody was coming up. You're sitting there. You're listening to a rhythm track. You know, maybe I think of the what we got to play. You know, so that 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 just happened to be uh, a little classical thing that came from a uh, a book of uh, of uh, musical riffs that I used to carry around with me. Yeah, that's and a hoochie we, yeah. hoochie coup part. Yeah, 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 yeah. So. Different people came up with different things, but it was really, really tight. Then. And with success, you know what happens with success? Everybody starts drifting. Well, everybody well, starts pulling away. Everybody well, sees things differently. 
um, hold that thought. I wanted to ask you, um, Merv. Um, well, I wanted to tell you and share with you that, you know, Skin Tight was the first album I ever bought on my own as a teenager. So <laughs> the very first, Skin Tight. Good, good on you. <laughs> yeah. As the Aussies would say, good on you, mate. Yeah, so that got me started right there. Uh, a, my best friend, his older brother, was in the service, and he had gotten exposed to it. And uh, he said, oh, yeah, you got to check this out, because I had, like, money to spend. And um, I bought it and never looked back. And uh, you guys became my favorite band. And uh, I just, you know, from then on, got every record the day it came out. Um, but uh, one of the things I really appreciate was what you were talking about, is how it was so self-contained. You know, everything was written by you guys. Everything was performed by you guys. You guys also produced. And just, you know, that cohesiveness was something special. Mm, it was. It was. But friction would, would rear its ugly head as uh, it became successful. And, as often, uh, all too often, yeah. Yeah, and you lose the focus on what you need to keep the focus on. We did one thing. We made the music. But in making music, unfortunately, what you have is you have a bunch of people around you. They're like vultures. And those vultures were there picking over not dead carcasses, live, living, breathing carcasses. <laughs> and they started to create the cracks. And then you have to realize also, we were one of the first groups to ever do all that stuff. I mean, Commodores came along. Uh, in fact, we put the Commodores on one of our shows that we did down there in Tuskegee and gave them a big boost and all of that stuff. They came along. Uh, but the very thing that makes you is what breaks you because everybody starts copying your sound. Everybody starts copying exactly what you do. And so your sound suddenly is not unique as it once was. It becomes the everyday thing. Everybody wants, here's, you know, you looked up and I looked up one time we were on stage and here's Lionel. Wow, wow, wow. You know, who's he? Where, I wonder where he got that from, you know. Yeah. And it's on, on a couple of his records. You can hear him doing that phrasing. So, they're, they're copying things you know they evolve they change oh yeah you know? people like the barquets and even they're throwing fire a little bit and yeah yeah i i used to always have at that time um i had a friend who his favorite group was earth wind and fire mine was the ohio players and we used to like kind of have you guys as rivals you know kind of like yes. later on they would talk about michael jackson and prince for then it was ohio players and earth wind and fire you know Yes, we viewed them that way. We, I had a lot of respect for those boys. Those boys could play. And they were very, very, very creative. Really, really liked them. To this day, when I'm playing stuff in the car, I've, got, of course, got, well, my car now, probably have 15,000 songs on the memory chip that's in my car. You know, so, of course, I got all of our stuff. And I've I've got all uh, Earth, Wind, and Fire stuff. And amazingly, we, we never played down here in Australia. Yet down here in Australia, because of folk shows on radio and stuff like that, our stuff gets played a lot. I'm in the grocery store the other day. And uh, my wife says, they're playing your song. I said, oh, the elevator music's playing our song. She said, yeah, listen, it's your stuff. I said, yeah. And then I was uh, I was at some conference, some uh, golf conference thing, and uh, somebody comes up to me and they said, "You played with Ohio players." I said, "Yeah, once upon a time in a, another life, an alternative universe, I did." <laughs> <laughs> Wish I was still doing it. Huh. Wow, uh, when. When you guys created Fire, did you feel like um, when you first heard that played back that it was just going to be, you know, a monster? 
We thought fire would be a hit. We did. You know, but it's hard to pick what you think you really like, what you like as the uh, as a song might not make it. It's all the public that, you know, determines what's going to be a song. They buy it. And as I said to many, many people over the years, you don't have to be the best. You just have to be good enough, you know, and you got to be lucky and you got to get some breaks. You know, all of that, everything has to fall in place for you to even get a chance to do it because there's so many great players out there. If, uh, if I look at it, there's so many players who were individually better, better as musicians, uh, but they never got the break. They never, the luck never quite fell their way. So you, you got to be grateful to to uh, whoever your God is <laughs> and everything else that you hold sacred uh, in life to say, yes, I was very fortunate to cross this path. And I'm very fortunate. I always say to everybody, especially people in my family, I am so grateful that I will leave a legacy where people will after, long after I'm gone still be listening and getting joy out of what I did. Absolutely. Um, we're so thankful for that, Merv. Um, how did how did you guys uh, come up with your horn arrangements? You know, did you take part in that as well or Satch or Pee yes. or? Yeah, we all did. When it, initially when we first started off, <laughs> You could never tell whose style it was. If it if it tended to be higher and classic with a classical overtone in it, it definitely would have been me. Uh Satch was more kind of in the middle and Pee Wee was more Pee Wee was more of the funk. You know, he was more uh that away. And we would sit there and we would we would just play stuff against whatever they put down as we were listening to the tracks, because you're listening to the track over and over and over and over and stuff's just going through your head. And then, uh, okay, they'll say, okay, we need this all filled in. And then we'll say, yep, let's do this, you know? Um, so it, it kind of evolved that way. It was like back in that day, it was, it was definitely Saturday, we and myself, we just come up with the lines. And I know that uh, Pee Wee also played some trombone, I think. So you guys had some overlap in brass. Uh, how would you decide, you know, who might do what? Pee Wee played trombone trade? and Pee Wee was a saxophonist. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Pee Wee was a, Pee Wee just, he picked trumpet up. <laughs> he was a saxophone player. That was his instrument. Wow. So, so Pee Wee played sax. Uh, Pee Wee's playing sax on on some of the albums as well as uh, as Satch. Uh, Pee Wee played tenor. Satch played alto, soprano, baritone, and tenor. But Pee Wee primarily stuck to tenor saxophone, mm -hmm. and he always had one on stage because Pee Wee would play saxophone all the time. I don't recall that many horn players that did both the woodwind and the brass. Yeah, it wasn't wasn't a lot, you know, because that reed is uh, kind of cutting your lip for a horn player. It's uh, different different uh, pressure on your mouth. Yeah, on your embouchure. Yeah. So, but you were playing flugelhorn sometimes, trombone sometimes, trumpet sometimes, right? So, I played flugelhorn, trombone. Trumpet, piccolo trumpet. So those were the four that I played. And would you just kind of play around and see what seemed to suit the song the best? Yeah, we would. Sometimes Billy would say he wanted a certain sound. He was looking for a certain sound on a thing. Uh, even before he got in the band, even Junie, like... Uh, Ba 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 da ba, your night. It's your night. So they want the different sounds. So they wanted that dark sound. So that's flugelhorn and, and trombone. You know, 
playing that kind of a sound. And then a uh, different sound. I think I used piccolo in Far East Mississippi, high, high overturns going through that, running through the background on that and stuff. It just depended on the song, what we were trying to get. And then we throw in different stuff and say, yeah, let's throw that in there. That should be okay. Yeah, sounds good to us. <laughs> Wonder if it'll sound good to them. You know, it, it was like O-H-I-O. -I, I hated that song. Hated it <laughs> with a passion. But yet it comes out to be a semi-hit. How do you go figure? Yeah, well, I remember I saw you guys live, and it was just a live thing you guys would do, you know, and then it yeah. got put on the record and was a hit. Yeah, it was like a surprise yeah. for sure. Go figure, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> every time we would play it, I would say, I hate this song, you know. <laughs> yeah. Was it fun for you doing things like that midnight special where you guys, I think, had the entire show and, you know, um, there wasn't many bands that got that kind of attention, you know? Uh, with Wolfman, that was the Wolfman show, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, you know, you. it's really another gig to you. You know, you're going, where are you going? I'm going to work now. I'm going to work. And then it turns into a, a fun thing because we got the whole town time and everybody's out there dancing around in the audience and jamming and stuff. Yeah. When, you, when I think back on it, I think back on all of those great memories. And, and those are great memories. And those were special moments in time. When you look on YouTube, you can probably find it. You know, my, my wife, she looks at everything. Like, I hardly ever go on Facebook, uh, Facebook or any of that stuff. Because if I go on it, what happens is I get the next day I'll have a thousand likes and this and that and stuff coming at me from all over uh well we know you or we we know so and so and so so there's no way that i can answer them you know i, I just don't have the time that to, to go there and do all that so i don't go up there much she does she checks everything oh look at this look at this what is that you're playing so, i know what it is at least she can fill you in then so yeah she does that yeah. yeah, she's always up there. He says hello to everybody. That's, that's <laughs> my wife. Uh, well, thank her for all of us as well. Um, I got to ask you, Merv, if you recall playing uh, when uh, Jazz A Lady came out and you guys had Funkonauts that you were trying to promote and you guys played the Roxy on Sunset Boulevard, small club, like yeah. three, three to 500 seater. You guys did two shows, early show and a late show. And I was at the early show and stayed through to the late show. And it really sticks in my mind because not only was it, you know, a special thing to see you guys in a small club like that, but I remember um, you looking at me. I was a white kid sitting in the front row and looking at me and kind of doing a double take when you saw I was still there at the second show. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> go man <laughs> yeah but you you whenever you're on stage as you know you you uh you kind of lock in on certain people out in the audience and you feel like especially that you're you're trying to play to them to, so that you get that that uh rapport going with them because they also start the rapport going with everyone around them. So you kind of lock in on people. And I had a habit of kind of locking in on different people that were in the audience, you know, or I'm playing to you. I can, I can remember when we played down in Houston at the big football stadium. Jesus, I came in on one song and I messed it up. First time I had seen those super, super large TV screens. And the sound, the echo sound, I lost sugar in my ear. Couldn't hear sugar. Couldn't hear his part. And I messed it up so bad, the intro, and I, I can remember saying, y'all don't want to hear me do this, do you? And it was like this huge roar, like 70, 80,000 people roar, screaming back at me, no! Two, three, four, that ain't allowed! Get it, you know? So... <coughs> The scale was so big, I didn't have that intimacy. And then the echo coming back at me, 
threw me for a second. It was the first time that we had ever seen the super, super big screens that were life size, that giant, giant size. That, that must have made you panic a little bit, I mean, I would think. No, I didn't panic. I just said, yuck. <laughs> you know, it was one of those things where, what the hell have I done? And I could see Sugar looking at me like, what have you just done? You know, so I had to just take off and just hit it again. Mm. But, of course, it was clean the next time. So it's those things. And I actually liked I actually liked working some of the tight small rooms because they were intimate, you know. And you're you're working the you get a chance to really, really work the crowd, you know, and and to be part of the crowd, you know, smaller. I like did a lot lot of shows like that in Las Vegas, because in Las Vegas you're playing in the in the hotels in the smaller rooms. And uh, it's very intimate because uh, the scale, the size, you know, they're 800,000 seaters. A big star like a uh, oh, big star would be playing in the, have the big room, you know, an Elvis would have the big room uh, or whoever it was that was playing there with you. And then you'd be playing there, but you'd be doing four shows, four shows during the night. During the night, the early show, the next show, the next show, and then the late show. Wow, you know, I can working, always that's remember. Working for it. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, I can remember walking home in Atlantic City, thinking when we played in one of the casinos in Atlantic City, and I'd say, "Jesus Christ, I'm going home at seven o'clock in the morning to go to bed, and the world's just waking up to go to work." I said, "What a life I have! I loved it." <laughs> you know yeah but those was, were the days yeah um well and uh that jazzy lady proved to be the last record for mercury uh, after i saw you guys at the roxy that time and i was just talking about and you went to arista for one record and then boardwalk there's much more to this great truth and rhythm interview just continue on to the next part of the episode also be sure to subscribe to this channel if you've already done so please share it with friends and become a member by joining Truth and Rhythm on Patreon or consider donating at funkinstuff.net. Thank you very much.